the second lecture in a two-part lecture series on the early Renaissance. The first lecture was on the early Renaissance in Italy, and this one is on the early Renaissance in Northern Europe. Now this lecture is a short one, and it's short because I did split the early Renaissance up into two lectures. And the reason why I did this is because there's two very different things that are happening in the North versus Italy during the Renaissance. And I wanted to be absolutely sure that you understood this. So I made two different lectures that address these two regions separately to hopefully really clarify these differences. Now the area that we're looking at in this map is Flanders. And this encompassed what is today Belgium, the Southwest Netherlands, and a small area of Northern France. Flanders at the time was a rich area that had many industrial, commercial, and banking cities that were pivotal for the economic development of Northern and Western Europe. Now the Italian Renaissance is best known for its painting and sculpture, and the Flemish Renaissance is really best known for its paintings, and that's what we're going to be concentrating on in this lecture. Now Flemish painting did not exhibit the same amount of classical influence particularly Roman classicism that Italian works did. And this makes sense if you think about it. Why might we see this less of a classical influence? The answer is simple if you think about it. The ancient Roman Empire was part of Italy's geographical and cultural history. Quite simply, this northern area is too far removed for, you know, the Italian classicism to have that cultural, that artistic relevance that it did down in Italy. There's another important thing to consider. So with Italian works, we know that they're religious. We saw that. We also saw that rise in secular, secular subject matter that was motivated by humanism. Now, it makes sense, though, that we would still see that religious stronghold on art production in Italy, because why? Where is the papacy located, the Pope? Pope is located in Italy, right? And this is gonna play out not necessarily as much here now, but definitely here once we get to the Reformation. Now in Flanders, there is a religious crisis that's going on. There's the Duke of Burgundy, and this is not the Philip of the bold Duke of Burgundy that we learned about in the pre-Renaissance. This is a new Duke of Burgundy and he controlled the lands of Flanders. What happened was he began to involve himself in the church for political gain. He realized that if he took high ranking religious offices that that would bolster his political clout. Now clergy saw this and um, either as a gesture of self-preservation or as a gesture of you know, wanting more power themselves, they began to take political offices and they neglected their religious duties in the process. So as a result, what you're seeing in the church is there was a lot of corruption. There were uh, people involved in the church that were engaging in immoral behavior. There was nepotism. And people were seeking out material gain rather than spiritual salvation. Now, of course, all of this is playing out in the public theater, right? People are watching this happen and it's not going down very well because it seemed like these shenanigans were not really reflective of the principles of Christianity. So to combat this, and it was perceived by the people as a spiritual crisis, the people of Flanders began to compensate by being as devotional and pious as possible. And this resulted in the commissioning of highly religious artwork. Now, there's an important point to this though. This idea of being devotional and pious as much as possible, this is not happening in the church. People are actually turning away from the church because they're seeing it as a problematic institution. They're starting to be religious and pious privately on their own, right? Trying to develop a personal relationship with God in the privacy of their own home. Now, because of this new commissioning of highly religious artwork, what we're actually seeing is a different type of religious artwork beginning to be produced in the early Renaissance in Northern Europe. These would be works of art created for private devotional use in the home. This was happening to such an extent the commission ratio was two to one. Now what I mean by that is for every one public religious work, two 
private religious works were being created, right? And that, that ratio gives you a sense of the extent to which people were turning away from the church and fostering their spirituality in this individual, private manner happening in, in the home. It's very important for us to note that this is happening, this dissatisfaction with the clergy, this trend towards private worship, this fostering of an individual relationship with God, because this is going to foreshadow things to come when we get to the Reformation. And the Reformation, as we're going to see, is specifically related to this area of Europe. Now we're gonna do a little bit of like a comparison in this lecture. We're gonna look at the, the traditional religious works, something that was public, and then we'll look at what is the, the new type of work, the private religious works. So this is the Ghent Altarpiece by Jan van Eyck, and this is one of the examples of the, the large scale public religious works. We're referring to them as altarpieces. These large-scale public altarpieces, these were at the time some of the most visible manifestations of piety, religious devotion. They were placed behind the altar and they would serve as the backdrop for the ritual celebrations of the Christian Mass. This would involve prayer, these ma the Masses, the, these rituals, they would involve prayer, contemplating the Word of God, and symbolically consuming the body and blood of Jesus as a way to remember his sacrifice. And this is why most scenes in these altars depicted scenes related to Jesus' sacrifice, his crucifixion, his martyrdom. Although I am gonna say, to kind of just like set the stage for future ideas, that this idea of symbolically versus literally consuming the body and blood of Jesus during Christian ritual, this is gonna become a point of contention during the Renaissance. And by the way, this idea of large public altarpieces, this is not a new thing. We see altarpieces being produced all throughout the medieval period. So this is basically continuing on a tradition that's already well established. Now in this amazing altarpiece, there's a lot going on. So I'm gonna show you some, some details. This photograph I brought in because I wanted to give you a sense of scale, how large these altarpieces truly were. The takeaway, they're huge. The altarpieces were, were intended to be seen by large public audiences in churches, not museums like we're seeing here. And they communicated the specifics of the Bible to those who were illiterate. They illustrated the words which brought them to life and helped people to conceptualize the ideas. They also reinforced church doctrine. They also provided dramatic uh, pictorial representation of biblical tales. And they also stimulated devotion and they aided in prayer and meditation. The takeaway, these large altarpieces, they're a big deal. The multi-format uh, image, the multi-image format that you see here this allowed artists to construct narratives through kind of like sequence of images. So these artworks were really effective at the retelling of, of biblical tales. Now the Ghent altarpiece is one of the largest and the most admired of the Flemish altarpieces of the 15th century. And it has a really interesting object biography that demonstrates how significant this particular artwork is. When you have a free moment, look up what happened to this altarpiece in both the First and Second World War. And by the way, this work of art is also prominently featured in the movie Monuments Men because of this history. There were parts of this artwork that were stolen. This artwork was hidden away to keep it safe. It was part of treaties. It was put into actual war agreements. And this goes to show the power of art, especially this work of art. And it also reinforces how art factors into warfare strategy. And this is a strategy that extends all the way back to when war even became a thing. Now, when it's opened, and we're looking at it opened here, what we're seeing is the depiction of superbly colored images of this conception of humanity's redemption. And of course, it's superbly colored. This altarpiece was painted by Jan van Eyck, who was pretty much the best oil painter to ever have walked 
this humble planet? Let's look at more detail so you can see what I mean. Gorgeous, so gorgeous. This is the upper register of the altarpiece. We've got God front and center. He's wearing the Pope's triple tiara. The number three is significant for the, uh, the Trinity. He, this is his spiritual crown that he's wearing, and then he has the earthly crown, the worldly crown at his feet. Over here, we have the Virgin Mary. We've got this crown here. And for those of you who took Art 200, remember that when you see Mary wearing some sort of royal iconography, that positions her as the queen of heaven, right? And that's a, a common Gothic theme. This is John the Baptist over here. We've got angels playing music on either side. And one thing that's cut away, I'm going to go back. Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve. And Adam and Eve are included because it supports this theme of salvation. They were the first humans to sin, and God addresses the implications of this action by sacrificing his son to Jesus. Now, one more thing random I'm pointing out. Eve looks pregnant here. She's actually not pregnant. It's very, very, very rare to see Eve depicted pregnant in Christian religious art. This is actually a convention of Flemish ideal beauty, the most beautiful female form in Flanders during this time was a fleshy woman who had meat on her bones and had this full belly that we see here. So she's just depicted as really beautiful, not pregnant. Okay, let's move on then. Just take a look again at how gorgeous this is. Let's look at the, the lower register here. So the lower register, they have the same symbolism as the upper register. Here's the central plan panel where you've got saints that have come from all around as well as significant religious figures. And they are gathering in this beautiful flowered landscape in the center of which is the fountain of life, right? This idea of living forever. And behind the fountain is an altar and on the altar stands a lamb, which signifies the sacrifice son of God, Jesus. This panel here on the far left, you'll notice is in the shadows, and the reason why is because it was stolen. This is no longer part of the artwork. We don't know, unfortunately, where this part of the artwork is located. I have another treat for your eyes. I have more details. You can see now why I'm saying that Van Eyck is like the best oil painter that ever walked the planet, because if you look at this, look how tiny this is. And then look how detailed this is. You have like a mini like painting within a painting here. It's just, it's incredible. I don't even know how it's possible. So this altarpiece, this is typical of Van Eyck, right? He's very much known for his intricate detail that's made possible through crisp, tight brushwork. It allows him to capture all these different textures, the glitter of gold, the sheen of fabric, the luster of pearls, the reflection of gems. I am seriously dying with how amazing and beautiful this is to look at. And it's really hard for me to show you how detailed and beautiful this artwork is on a PowerPoint. My heart's kind of breaking at this moment. As a gift to yourself, I strongly recommend going on Google and looking at high resolution imagery of this incredible work of art. I am gonna throw one thing in though. Take a look at these hands, right? They're, they're kind of elongated, a little bit on the weird side, that reminds me a lot of the Byzantine approach to representing hands and elongated figures. So we can see that again, we, we continue to have medieval traditions that are perpetuating in this early Renaissance work. You've got this surface that is luminous with light and reflection. You've got intricate detail. And all of this is made possible, not only because of Van Eyck's greatness, but because of oil paint. And most Northern European artists used oil paint. I'm pointing this out because this is different than what the Italians used, which was typically a tempera paint, which was used with egg to bind the pigment, or they would use fresco for their large scale mural paintings, which was painting on plaster. These different media, oil versus uh, tempera and fresco in Italy, these are important to note because they create different visual effects. Oil paints, and you can see this here, produce richer, deeper colors. 
and they allow for crisper details. These are hallmarks of Northern early Renaissance painting that we don't quite see being paralleled down in Italy. What we can see is that the painting, and again, a lot of this is coming from the use of oil, is, is quite realistic. And this is something that Flemish painting, it was a commonality at least, that Flemish painting had with Italian art at the time, this commitment to, to realism, trying to replicate the natural world as faithfully and as accurately as possible. And so that is a similarity that we can note here. Now let's move on to the Marode altarpiece by the Master of Flamel. This is an example of a work of art that was used for private devotional purposes. As I said at the beginning of lecture, during this time there was an increased amount of art that was commissioned for private devotional use in the home. Now this painting is what we call a triptych, and you've got your spelling right in here, triptych, three-part panel, and it can be opened and closed when necessary. In the central panel, we have the popular Annunciation theme. This is when the angel Gabriel approaches Mary, who is seated reading right here. And he says to her, Mary, even though you've never enjoyed sexy time, surprise, you are pregnant. And this news is conveyed to Mary as she sits within a middle class, middle class Flemish home. And we can make this identification through the carefully rendered architectural details in the background of the scene. You also have accessories, furniture, utensils, clothing, and all of these further help to identify the setting as Flemish. Now these objects are not merely decorative, they're all religious symbols. Now this is something that is typical of 15th century Flemish painting, highly, highly symbolic paintings, full of symbols that communicate messages beyond what's apparent in first glance. Now, this is kind of breaking my heart because I'm so into symbolism, but I am not gonna do an iconographic analysis here. If it is burning inside of you to know the iconography of this painting, you certainly can read about it further in your textbook or what I suggest is that you do your own iconographical analysis using the online symbolism dictionary. Now this idea of a significant religious miracle happening in a Flemish home is important because there's nothing about this that's classical. Nobody is in a toga, there's no columns, there's no geometric symmetry, which is typical in classical architecture. None of that is there. So this reinforces this idea that there is a lack of classical influence in Northern Renaissance art. Now let's look at the other panels. On the left here, we have the Engelbrechts. Any guesses who they might be? If you guess the patron, you would be correct. Once again, the patrons have been included in the artwork. Here, we see that they have been permitted to witness this momentous event through an open door. Why do they get such privilege? Because they're so pious and so devoted to their religion. So they show this so that anyone who comes to their home sees this and knows how religious they are, knows how dedicated they are. Even though they worship privately in their home and not so frequently in their church, they are so religious, they personally witness the Annunciation. Now on the right, we have the depiction of Joseph, who is engaged to be married to the Virgin Mary, who is depicted in the central panel as we know. Joseph was a carpenter and we see him hard at work in his profession. He's not just doing any old carpentry here though. What he's doing is he's making a mouse trap. This refers to the crucifixion of Jesus. This idea that Jesus was crucified. He was martyred on a wooden cross. And that wooden cross is seen sort of as conceptually and maybe materially related to the mouse trap, that trap to ensnare Satan. Now the martyr Jesus that this is referring to is the very Jesus who Mary just found out she's pregnant with. So we can clearly see the conceptual relationship that's existing between these two panels. And let me go back for one more minute. Just wanna reinforce, like our Ghent altarpiece, notice tight, crisp brushwork, really fine detail, deep, rich color, oil paint.
And the same exact thing can be said here, right? Which this one looks a little dark for some reason. I'm not quite sure uh, why. Now this painting, this is Last Supper. This is a significant painting because it's believed to be the first representation of the Last Supper in Flemish art. The Last Supper is a biblical subject that enjoys popularity in both early and high Renaissance artwork. Now what's unique about the Flemish interpretation of the Last Supper is what the artist chose to depict. Remember that idea, right, of choice, the choice in narrative. The typical approach would be to make Judas's betrayal a big part of the narrative. Now we do have the inclusion of Judas in the typical manner. He's right here. Now what's typical is he is placed on the opposite side of the table and he's got his hand on his hip and he kind of looks sort of like, um, almost sort of like defiant and he's all sketchy and shady and you know the typical way that Judas is shown. But in this painting, instead of that being the focus, what we're really seeing the focus on is more uh, the transformational, the, the religious miracle aspect of it. Uh, again, with this idea of the body and the blood of Jesus, this religious miracle. It's known as the Eucharist, which you don't need to know how to spell that. Also, it's known as the communion, where the wine and the bread that's here as part of this meal is turned into the blood and the body respectively. Now this emphasis um, on the communion, on the Eucharist is important because as I said earlier in this lecture, the nature of how exactly this bread and wine factors into Christian religious ritual, again, is gonna become really a big point of argument during the, Re uh, the Reformation. Now we have a similar approach to that of the Marode altarpiece in that this is a, a really significant religious event that yet again is taking place in this unassuming middle-class Flemish home. Jesus is in the middle, and this is easy for us to identify through the use of implied lines, and we also have a bit of a hierarchical scale situation going on. He's also the only one who makes direct eye contact with the viewer, and that also is gonna grab our attention as well. Now, what we also have in the background is we have some servants here, here, and looking through the window here. Now, this is not typically depicted servants in traditional representations of Last Supper. And it's my understanding that according to the Bible, there were not servers or servants that were present at the Last Supper. So do you have any idea of why these people might be included? If you guessed patrons, you would be correct. They are very likely portraits of the, paint of the patrons. And what's really exciting is we actually know who the patrons are for this painting because the contract that the patrons drew up with this artist to create this painting, that contrast, con sorry, that contract still exists for art historians to study. The patrons were the Louvain Confraternity of the Holy Sacrament. And this concludes our two-part lecture series on the early Renaissance.